Ophelia has is obsessed with fairy tales and she's always reading books and everything. Ophelia wanders off one night following this kind of insect thing, fairy, insect, whatever it happens to be, and finds um, a labyrinth. And at the center, this pan figure, this is kind of goat man figure in the center, uh, says, "Oh my goodness, you're the you're the princess that we've lost all this time ago. We've been we've been here on Earth looking for you, and finally we found you. Um, we you know it, we'd like you to come back to your true home, but we want to make sure that you're ready. And so here we have these quests for you. And so she goes through a series of quests, and at the end of the movie." Uh, she's shot. She she dies in the middle of the labyrinth, or she returns to her home with the king, the king and queen, and she is the princess, and she's returned <coughs> to her throne. This is an almost an exact retelling of the hymn of the pearl, um, it, which is it just I, I love the movie. I love it for the, because it's a good movie, but I also love it for the the hymn of the pearl references. Um, it's it, it's it's fabulous, but. Uh, Anybody else want to add anything about that? And as we as we talk about the fallen <coughs> and the, the lost princess and being returned to her um, to her home, um, of course, those of you who are cabalistically inclined will um, will look towards the Yahe Vahe and the, <coughs> the royal parents and the prince and the princess and mm -hmm. Sophia Akhmoth being Malkuth. And, uh, Sporks. and it's a, it's a story of, of ascending through the middle pillar, the tree of life, and the dyna and the dynamism inherent in the name of God. Mm -hmm. Sandy? Yeah, I was just going to say, I just thought of another movie that might have um, this kind of theme, like you were talking about. It's called Coraline. Oh, oh yes. I haven't seen that yeah, yet. Yeah. Good. Yeah. yeah, it's a it stop like motion like animation. <coughs> but I, like, like you said before, with Pam's mm. I think it's too dark. For, oh, yeah. for folks who have, dark. if you have ideas, send them to us because part, yeah. part of what we're doing with this discussion also is is launching the idea or exploring the idea of how to do a Gnostic movie night. Yeah, <laughs> there are there are licensing problems with doing it, especially now that we're an incorporation and <coughs> corporations are people too, according to some <laughs> folks. Um, but we're 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 working on how to do that. So write them down and make sure we have a list. We it's <laughs> not as hard as you think. We'll, oh, okay. Cool. We'll see if we can we'll see if we can reach our legal staff. <laughs> uh, okay, great. Um, let's move on. Another movie from the thirties. Yeah. Okay. Snow White. <laughs> yeah, um, or show white, snow white. So typing is hard. Yeah. So um, the story begins, of course, with the, um, or the heart of the story begins with again with a princess who's in exile from the palace, from the kingdom. Um, in she's exiled into the world of matter, chaos, the wilderness, right. Um, so you, again, you have the you have again the princess exile story. You have the the dualism of the two, the the two worlds, the kingdom, the palace, and this deep dark forest. Um, you know, one of the interesting one of the interesting things about the movie is if we think about the way that the the, the classical Gnostics and their contemporaries were very interested in the relationship of man or of humanity. And the fates, and being trapped by fate, and, and and gnosis was something that liberated you from being controlled by fate. Um, and you know, the, the Gospel of Philip and others talk about how somebody who's who's uh, who's attained to the bridal chamber is no longer ruled by canonic powers. So the relationship of and there's a there are even references in some of the Gnostic texts, for instance, to how. Um, if somebody's been liberated by the, the bridal chamber or the ascension, that astrology no longer works for them. Yeah. Because that's a fate thing, mm -hmm. and they're no longer in control of these forces, right? Yeah. And they're no longer control, they're no longer in the house of these seven worldly powers, these seven minor, tiny powers, these seven mm -hmm. dwarfs, <coughs> which is where Snow White ends up being. Uh, taking a refuge in the house, mm -hmm. and the house there is quite often a symbol of the body. So it's so, this, so, so her taking refuge in, in a cottage of the seven dwarfs is in the is, wilderness is yeah. the soul, the spark in exile from the kingdom, 
taking up abode in the body that is now governed by the seven dwarfs or the seven planetary spirits. To the angels, of course, there were seven. We had nine, now we have eight, but for our purposes we have seven. Um, so again, we, we um, and of course, interestingly enough, she, uh, what finally gets her is eating the apple, which is poisoned. Um, and then just like many of the Gnostic stories, she's saved by a redeemer prince, the descent, the descent of the Soter, who is a redeeming figure. And, um, and they are reunited and, 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 and enter into wedlock, which is the bridal chamber. Very, very Valentinian, and again we could also talk about the name of God here, the Yod Hey, uh, mm -hmm. um, and the, the role of the prince descending to rescue the the, the princess in Malkuth. Right. Again, it's another hymn of the pearl story, where in this case it's a, it's a prince, but in the hymn of the pearl, it's an eagle who descends mm -hmm. to bring the message of liberation. And so, I mean, it's I don't necessarily. Well, maybe we can do commentary uh, on the the whole subject at the end, but I don't think that the these storytellers are necessarily Gnostics. Yeah. They're they're not they're not saying, hmm, I'd really like to write a story with a Gnostic myth in it. I just think that these things are such universal human yeah. stories that we all feel <laughs> the alienation and we all feel like sometimes that this world is, is less real and that we yearn to be a, a, a prince again or a princess in the kingdom. And so these kinds of things are, are universal, and I think that's why Gnosticism is so important, but that's just me. Yeah. Anybody else? Snow White? Anybody want to sing a song? No? Okay. Did anybody else see Gnosticism in Snow White besides me? Yeah, I mean, that was a new one on me, too. Yeah, would you explain it? Yeah, no, it's it fantastic. Well, Tanya Lee, in one of her rewritten fairy tales, makes it a, well, definitely expressly Christological. Mm -hmm. Yes, that's true. Okay. Well, right, and the Redeemer figure would certainly be a Christ figure. And the, the quote, evil queen and her patron is a more ambiguous feature. Mm. It's sort of the up, um, catapodic, maybe. Mm. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't think in all, you know, all these films don't have exactly a one-on-one, -on -one, this is the Demiurge, this is that figure. <laughs> but they all, as Father said, sort of... Sort they of, hit several of those they points. Point to this, they yeah. point to this impulse. It keeps it keeps <coughs> recurring, yeah, and with some very specific references, and it, it doesn't mean there's a worldwide Gnostic conspiracy. <laughs> it, it just, it, 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 Why it, not? It, yeah, I know, right? It <laughs> just means that Sophia Sophia continues to manifest and to call, and, and that and that breaks through in different ways. It breaks through in the sacrament when we celebrate and the the anamnesis of Christ. It breaks through in art and poetry and music and dance and, and community and in many other ways. Mm -hmm. All right, and this next one you haven't seen, but uh, Dark City. Anybody seen oh, Dark I've City? Heard of it. Yes. yes. Uh, it came out around the no. same time as the Matrix. It did. And the only reason it wasn't as successful is the way it was cut. I don't think it was. It was, was edited yeah, very poorly. It spoiled poor. itself. Yeah. Yeah, but I think they re-released it without that silly beginning. Yeah. But basically, it was like the Matrix from a noir, a film noir yeah. standpoint. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I like it. Vi visually, much. very very pretty movie. Well, yeah. gritty, film but noir. Film yeah. Noir, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So the the story starts off with a guy who is um, a guy who wakes up in a bathtub and he doesn't know doesn't know what happened. He has amnesia. He doesn't. He, but he finds a dead hooker in the bedroom, which you do uh, now and then. But so and he it's a it's a murder mystery kind of thing. So he has to figure out who the murderer is before the cops ha find him and arrest him. But all the while they're living in this artificial world. And, it, and there are these little clues that things aren't exactly right. What, ha what is actually happening is that there are these aliens called the Strangers who control this world. And it's not a very big world. It's just kind of like a little floating city. It's about the size of a city. And it's floating in space. Uh, spoilers. <coughs> and what happens is the, the aliens have the ability through their minds to reshape reality to whatever they want. So... They're experimenting on these people. They're trying to learn from these people. Um, they're trying to. I think they're trying to learn how to have emotions. I believe is what the, the actual plot of the thing is. That's not important. Um, but uh, Kiefer Sutherland plays their like human henchman, and uh, it, it, he's quite good in it. And he has a. Uh, he, he's he he's sympathetic towards 
the characters that he's been <laughs> manipulating. Yeah. Um, and so he kind of plays that role of the revelatory figure. He turns uh, in the end. Yeah. yeah. So he's he's the one who tells this guy things aren't exactly right, um, points him in the right direction, and through that knowledge, through that awareness, that understanding of what's happening to the real world, what's what the real world is is like, or what the fake world is like. Um, he, the, the protagonist, realizes that he ha also has the ability to reshape reality and to do that using the same powers that the aliens have, although he turns it against them. And he becomes the ruler of this world. He becomes the god. He becomes theosis. <coughs> um, so, um, if there's a tagline to walk away with today, um, it'll come from our next movie. And that <laughs> is Meatloaf as the sacred androgyne. Um, and of course we're talking about Fight Club. If, Fight if, if folks seen Fight Club, Fight Club. I believe it or not, I've never seen it. You know, everyone else has seen it. Well, there are, there are a lot of interesting things in Fight Club. <laughs> not the least of which. <laughs> but of course, uh, one, of the, one of the characters there, or one of the important characters who eventually uh, is sacrificed, is the, is the character played by Meatloaf. And if you remember, uh, because he was a juicer, he had developed large breasts also. In, in the movie they're referred to as, excuse my French, bitch tits. And there's an explicit religious reference to them as the, you know, sort of the Divine Mother when Cornelius, or the main character, says you know, they, that they, they were huge the way you would think of as gods as being huge. Huh. And that he takes comfort hugging there right there between, between his giant if we been in meatloaf. So meatloaf has the sacred androgyne. Yeah. Wow. I, that's a bit more of a stretch, but I know you've been wanting to say that for 24 hours. Uh, <laughs> no, but okay. So Fight Club is a little, uh, we were on the fence about whether to include Fight Club or not. We ended up we're including it because there are some things that, you know, you can point to and say that they could be arguably Gnostic. Um, so I, I think more uh, Manichaean. Uh, specifically, um, well, but there, but one of the themes that does run through it is is the sort of the and, and androgynous thing, and you know even from like a Valentinian perspective, mm -hmm. for instance, they believe that the fall took place when Adam and Eve were separated, that when they were together there was no there was no death, and then and so the, they look one of the metaphors they would use for the fall is the creation of Eve and that separation, and that's why throughout their stories that cosmology is always divine pairs and their salvation story is a divine pair it's the bridal chamber which being reunited with the angel so there is a um, and the idea in Fight Club of uniting with your divine twin and sort of a masculine feminine pair it's just in this case the, the masculine is Brad Pitt and, and the feminine is, is, it, Edward Norton. is Edward Norton yep who are Ikea boy yeah, yeah, it's an interesting it's an interesting take on it. Um, so, uh, if you haven't seen Fight Club, the character who is unnamed in the movie, but people call him Jack, um, he is, you know, he goes about his daily life. He has a job he doesn't like. Um, he he has a split in his personality. And he becomes two people. He becomes Brad Pitt, and then this in the Edward Norton character. And um, through this, he comes to realize, you know, that there's another part of him that is kind of the polar opposite, and of what you know, all the things that he's not in his daily life that he's created and split off. And then they create this Fight Club. Um, which says a lot of interesting things about the world, but uh, at the end of the movie, by reuniting with that, those two parts of his personality causes him to have that revelation of the way the world really is. And what is it he says when he puts the gun in his mouth and kills himself? He says, my eyes are open? Yeah, yeah, right? my eyes are open. And yeah. then Brad Pitt at one point says, you have to consider the possibility that God doesn't like you. In fact, right. he probably hates you. In fact, he probably hates you, which right. is a reference to the Demiurge. Right, and elsewhere refers to uh, you know God's unwanted yeah. children. Yeah. yeah. Same. Oh, oh, she, oh. she waved her hand first. You know, I've been through the course of this conversation trying to think of what <coughs> distinguishes sort of Gnostic 
dual realities mm. as opposed to just every dream. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, mm. like, you know, just to throw it out there, like, is Alice in Wonderland, Peter Pan, like, there's other things. And one of the things, in my mind, thinking over the issue, that distinguishes it is this struggle the struggle to get past yes. the false reality mm -hmm. that that it's it's a journey and a search as opposed to oh I just had this really wacky dream right. and woke up from it sort mm -hmm. of spontaneously the, the, the smoking caterpillar right well but in in Fight Club I think especially there's that so you know Edward Norton's character works really hard to figure it out and yeah. again it's this idea of sort of having the clues and are you going to pursue them right or are you just going to continue? And, right. Are you going to like sort of confront these really difficult pieces of information to put together? And in that sense, I don't know if you guys have seen it, but Memento. I've seen it. And, and, and I mean, I'm just saying again, yeah. like kind of thinking in some ways, what is or isn't a Gnostic movie? You know, in that right. it, in, in Memento, what happens is there's a man who has sort of amnesia, but the whole movie is him trying to piece together like a chain of events, and in that sense has the struggle of mm -hmm. like sort of coming, having a certain reality that you know is sort of an incomplete or false mm -hmm. reality, right. and then having to work really hard and struggle and go through a process to sort of get mm -hmm. to some sort of larger knowledge. And in that and movie, literally an unforgetting. And at, right. and at the end of the movie, the world is destroyed, or at least in a symbolic way, at the end of Fight Club, yeah. standing yeah. there watching these yeah. buildings being destroyed and, 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 and that you know that points again to a lot of the Gnostic scriptures that talk about the one who's, who's, who's awakened for them the, the pleroma has ceased to rule over them the powers have ceased to rule over them mm -hmm. the there wasn't there was an eschatology for the Gnostics but a, but a lot of times it was it was a, a, an, an imminent eschatology the end of the world eschatology are, uh, means you know the study of, of what's going to happen at the end of the world but for a lot of the Gnostics, um, would, they would they would personalize that, and they would talk about the end of the world being what happens at Fight Club, where the old the old your eyes are open and the old is destroyed, and you wake it up and we wake up into the new, as uh, Saint Michael Stipe says, it's the end of the world as we know it, and I feel fine. Mm -hmm. Same. Yeah, I was thinking also could be uh, June could be sort of that kind of message because I don't know if you if anyone is. I think somebody's June. seen Dune. Yeah. yeah. There was one line. Which one? <laughs> <laughs> there was one line in the movie that kind of reminds me of what you were saying earlier that um, I even forgot the character. The sleeper is awakened. Yeah. yeah. The sleeper is well, awakened. That was my favorite awakened. line. Yeah. Yeah. It was Paul, but, my dear. Yeah. Atreides. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. When he was becoming a, realizing he was a quiz at Exactly. Yeah. Mm. Right, what he said. <laughs> um. <laughs> All right, then we, we kind of lumped a couple of movies in here, wh which... We're not going to talk about Meatloaf anymore? <laughs> we're, we're done with Meatloaf. I think we covered right. we covered the sacred androgyne. That we, a couple of movies that we felt were worth, worth mentioning because they had themes of the fake reality, the, the false reality. Um, Existence, have you seen it? No, no. I think it's probably best if you didn't. Existence. It's, it's, it's not very good. It's, um, I didn't like it, but... I, <laughs> it's really interesting in conception if you can sit through it to the end. But yeah. it, it's um, folks who are playing a, 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 a virtual reality game. That it's a serious virtual reality in the sense that you could, you know, you would think you were in an actual reality. Which in fact they do. And then when they come out of it towards the end, um, you're left with the question of maybe they weren't really playing a game, but they were playing a game in which they were playing a game. <laughs> and so you have now multiple levels. Of possible false realities, right. very, like very <laughs> Phil K. Dick, yeah, in, yeah. Its, in its feel. Yeah. Um, it came out of the, at the, about the same time as the Matrix. Um, uh, a little after, I think. I think ninety-seven. Okay. I think it was ninety-seven. Anyway. And it's got Jude Law in it, and Christopher uh, Eccleston before Doctor Who. Right. Yeah. I, I relate everything to Doctor Who, but yeah. Yeah, there was a movie with Arnold Schwarzenegger. I'm trying to remember. Well, we'll get to that. Total Recall, yeah. Oh, yeah. Total Recall. Yeah, we'll, yeah. we'll get to that. <laughs> um, the Thirteenth Floor. Anybody seen that one? No. That's actually a pretty good movie, I think. Uh, it's got Vincent D'Onofrio, um, some other guy. 
I forget the I forget the main character's name. I, I didn't I didn't see it. No, so it was a pretty good movie. Um, it's another one of these virtual reality game within a game kind of things. Um, it, only worth mentioning for that. No, nothing else really stands out to me anyway as overtly gnostic, but certainly has those those elements of struggling again, struggling to find what the true reality is. Um, and then Twelve Monkeys. I'm sure some yeah. of you have seen Twelve Monkeys. Yes. Terry Gilliam, uh, as a as a writer and a director, often deals with old themes kind of similar to this, where you know what is what is real, what isn't. Um, it's why uh, um, uh, can I never remember the bald guy's name? Bruce Willis. Bruce Willis. Thank you. <laughs> I don't know. So Bruce Willis is a convict in the future, um, where humanity lives underground because there has been some kind of devastating virus that allows life on the surface or makes life on the surface impossible. So he volunteers in order to commute his sentence to go back in time and see if he can figure out where the source of the virus came from and how to stop it. Um, but as he goes back in time, they capture him right away and figure that he's crazy, so he gets you know, treated by a psychiatrist who ends up kind of believing that he is from the future. Uh, you know, and it's, it's, it's kind of a wacky movie, and it's you don't know which reality is real and he goes back and forth and Brad Pitt is also in it and Brad Pitt plays a great character in it um, so and then it also brings up questions of determinism and fate versus free will mm -hmm. in that particular movie you know because the things it's it's not so far in the future uh, Bruce Willis was alive in the time period that he gets sent back to he was a child so there are things that he remembers from when he was a child but now he's an adult in that same time period and so it, it brings up the question is like is there anything that actually can be done to change the fates can you change your own fate and that's not specifically Gnostic either but well it has a lot of resonance I mean there are, yeah. lot, there are lots of explicit references in Gnosticism too I mean there's the, the one that we were looking at where Jesus breaks the zodiac yeah yeah from in, uh, Pista Sophia in yeah. Pista Sophia where he Jesus takes the uh, uh, the, wheel the, zodiac, the wheel of the zodiac and spins it this way six months and then spins it the other way six months and it's an, it's an image of destroying yeah. destroying breaking the power hold of the fates of, yeah of breaking fate and breaking the hold of fate for the individual yeah anything else on any of those movies 12 monkeys okay Bruce Willis I know yeah I'm sorry <laughs> <laughs> the trial of Bruce Willis Spoilers. Witnesses the adult Bruce Willis yeah. die. Yeah. Oh, wow. yeah. And then remembers towards the end. He's like, oh, I remember <laughs> being here now and I remember seeing this guy die and oh my god, that was me. Yeah. It's kind of crazy. Wow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Terry Gilliam is. A, I, I love Terry Gilliam's movies. And, and Brazil? Brazil, yeah. Brazil. Oh, yeah. I love that. I was yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. There was one more I, I thought of Jacob's Ladder. Oh, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Very much. Yeah. It was a, it was a death dream. The entire oh. film was yeah. a death dream. It's like you know, after yeah. a while, by the end of the movie, you don't know what is real and what isn't. Mm. Like, yeah. This guy was hallucinating, or what is he experiencing? Yeah. Yeah. And God, God is it just chiropractor. Again, I, all right. We're gonna we're gonna post these yeah. notes up on some place. I don't know where we'll post them on the website or something. But please do add add these to because we'd we'd like to have kind of a comprehensive list and we can talk about it. Something which doesn't re uh, directly relate to the movies, but what do you, do you say about the simulation argument? Which yeah. is the simulation? Argument? Okay, it was popularized. If that's the oh, word, yes, by and Nick Bostrom, and they were just and doing. Why are you all? Why you are almost certainly living in a computer simulation? Yeah. Um, yeah, certainly. I mean, but I, I think that's. I think that again speaks to that same impulse for all of these artists to create sure. these movies. You know, um, and whether it's a computer simulation or whether it's a false reality created by a magical sky wizard or whatever it happens to be. You know, it's the same impulse. It's the same desire in us to find a truer reality. Okay, and relating it in Star Wars on trial, one of the defense witnesses argues that Lucas was trying to blow the gaff by depicting the Jedi's who really get their powers by exploiting the bugs in their simulation, thereby enabling us to figure out that we're in a simulation. Are you talking about the prequels? Because I don't remember there being any prequels no. to... Uh, no, there uh, were no prequels. <laughs> so, 
Yeah, okay, so then we, we have a couple of honorable mentions here. Um, uh, Hedwig and the Angry Inch. Anybody seen that one? Must I? Uh, no, you don't have to. We have, a, we have a friend who's a Gnostic priest who watches it on a certain day every year. Yeah, uh, it, watches, it, watches it with his parish. It's, it's an interesting... And they, um, they did a fundraiser... Uh, when I was doing my book, they had a head rig in the angry itch, and they, they raised money. Oh, that's right. Yeah. Anyway, um, it's uh, without getting into too much detail because it, we're we're already running a bit long. Um, it's it has a lot of androgyny in it. Um, you know, some uh, gender bending stuff that you you see in in movies. But uh, the there is a there's a desire by the main character to reunite with the with her divine twin, and that sh through that un unification she will feel whole again. Um, the, and the, uh, the character is called Tommy Gnosis in the movie. Oh, so, that's a, right. so <coughs> honorable mention. Um, another honorable mention: Pleasantville. Anybody oh, seen yes. that? Yes. Who's that? Toby McGuire. Who? Toby McGuire. Yeah. And yeah. Reese Witherspoon. Reese Witherspoon. Yeah. They go into nineteen fifties world. It's all black and white. Right. And as it becomes more. More close to reality. Well, and again, it's it's an it's it's an overcoming of, of the falseness of the world by rebel yeah. rebelling against the laws of the world. You know, it's very it's very Sethian in in, in feel, and Sethian in the way that the Sethians were interpreted by the heresiologists, mm -hmm. where um, the idea being that the demiurge, the false god, was all about uh, restrictions and law. And that gnosis was somehow connected to rebelling against, uh, against yeah. that. Um, I don't know if that was actually the position of any Sethian groups, no. but there were guys like Irenaeus who certainly thought that there was, and there were people. Um, and so that has sort of that feel to it. Yeah. It was sort yeah. of um, rebelling against the man was, you know, the way to gnosis and liberation. Right, and again, in, in that sense, that knowledge is liberating. Yeah. The knowledge of something beyond their world. So, honorable mention there also. Um, one of your favorites, Groundhog Day. Groundhog Day, yeah. <laughs> right? Uh, you know, and when you first t when you first mentioned Groundhog Day to me, I'm like, you're crazy. But I, you kind of talked me into it. God, talk everybody into it. Well, well yeah, you know, I, there there are interesting things in Groundhog Day. Whether any of these movies is Gnostic is is always depending on where we put our definitions. But you know, you've got twin forecasters named Phil, um, Phil Collins, and Buxatani Phil. Phil and Connors. Phil Connors. Phil yeah. Collins was in the band with the stuff. Genesis. That's that's right. That's a demiurgic figure to be sure, <laughs> but um, who replaces the, the 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 authentic God Peter Gabriel? But that's all. That's that's for Gnosis and movie and, and music, which is another discussion. Um, but you have this uh, this says, and it's, it's, this is also a very Buddhist idea. But you but you find this also in the Gnostics, the idea of of, of recurrence and sameness. And, and there are uh, hints at reincarnation. And if not reincarnation, the fact that it's just the same old stuff every day mm -hmm. until, you're li until you're liberated out of this. And you know, one of the interesting um, concepts in early Christianity was that Sunday, um, which is the day that we go to Mass, um, and experience anamnesis, which is a loss of forgetfulness. Sunday is not the seventh day of the week, nor nor is it nor is it the first day of the week. It's the eighth day of the week, because it is a day of a different kind of character. You break out of the one through seven, and you enter into the eight, which is a whole new order of a kind of day. And this is what happens to the to uh, Phil Collins. See, uh, Phil Connors in the Groundhog Day is that he escapes from this uh, cycle and he, and he you know he does everything he can to exploit to escape you know yeah through his ego and his materialism and right yeah. worldly things and p finds ways to pick up women and it's only when he surrenders to being who he is to to off to authenticity true um, self knowledge true yeah. self knowledge and 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 almost, and there's almost a, there's almost at the same time there's a desire to escape, but the, by the end there's almost a letting go that I'm going to be here fully and authentically, and compassionately. That then he wakes up into the into the new day, which is of course the eighth day of of anamnesis. It's the it's the new day of the kingdom. Mm -hmm. um, my hard drive is about to.